So firstly, just getting the two hands in sync is, is your first main challenge. Uh, so rhythms can really help there, but there's another trick which I find really helps get hands in sync. One of them is to move two octaves apart. So we do this. Can really help. The other one is to cross hands over and do the same pattern. And suddenly those two things can really help the brain. It kind of forces it to get the two hands working together somehow. It's the separation of the two octaves and it's somehow the crossover that can really help. And you can also do scales like that as well. We'll really get kids focused. Okay, so uh, there are my three kind of tricks for the Bergmuller and some tactics that may help. Now for Claire de Lune, um, one of the initial challenges in this isn't actually technical, but students always make it and that's counting. Students really fail to recognize that they need to count at the start because they kind of hear it goes something like, uh, and you'll have students just kind of play through it. They have no sense of the timing at all. Uh, because they've heard it so many times they're just kind of copying the feel of it. But I think a great option here is just to count out loud the, the three, three groups of three, the nine, eight. So it'd have one, two, three, sorry, one, two, three, one, two, three, It's amazing how that will surprise the students and how far off the ball they normally are with those. So that's my first tip for Claire de Lune. <clears throat> now another challenge of this one is at the start of page two where we've got the chords happening up here. And the real challenge here is of course that the top note really has to ping on the piano. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to put more weight on the pinky finger than the rest of the fingers. So I'll have students, uh, one, one thing to do in this kind of a circumstance is to just play that melody. Just play the melody notes on their own. So they've got, they know what to listen out for. And then uh, simply just, playing the chord until they've got the balance that they want. And could they actually play, uh, sorry, I'll do it down the octave here. Could they play with the thumb being the strongest as, as a, a chain? Thumb's really pretty easy because it tends to be a clunky, heavier finger anyway. Uh, second finger, can we bring out this note? These are great challenges for an advancing uh, and late intermediate student because they will need to be able to balance the notes in a chord. So just playing them, repeating them and feeling how they can bring out certain notes. They'll just need to practice it over time and it will get better. So that's a really important one. Finally, in any kind of uh, piece of advancing repertoire like this, getting the fingering right and to suit the student is so important. And I made the mistake early on in my career of just giving students um, my fingerings and just sort of saying, here's, here's the right way to finger a passage. But of course, uh, that doesn't necessarily work with students because they don't all have, I've got fairly large hands, I can pretty easily play 11ths, um, even 10ths, uh, sorry, um, 9ths and 10ths. Um, that's not gonna be the case with all our students, of course. So in a passage like uh, the Debussy again, uh, the top of the, uh, what is it, third page where we've started to get, To work out the best way to for your students to uh, use their fingers most effectively in those passages so take the time to do that but avoid telling them what to do what I always say is let's try a couple of different fingerings and see which one suits you best so does that work best for the start the first uh, uh, four notes and then over or is it better for you to go here and then drop, drop the third finger in? It really depends on the student, but by the time they're getting to 
this kind of repertoire, this early advanced repertoire, they should be able to test a few different fingering passages themselves and then come up with the one that suits best. Of course, I'm more than happy to help them and give my advice and, and see them playing stuff and go, oh, that doesn't look quite right. How about we try this? But I want them to have experimented with a few different options first. And of course, as we know, so many students just kind of ignore fingering or play different fingers all the time. Um, and many of them never write in their fingering, which is uh, something I always try and ask them to do. Okay, the last piece I'm going to um, demonstrate, this is one of my favorites. And it's, it's here, it's called uh, Midnight Ride. Pop it up on the overhead camera here. Uh, it's by Melody Boba. It's in my Piano for Leisure books here in Australia, um, but I'm sure available anywhere around the world. And it's a great rollicking pirate-like theme in 12-8. Kids love this one, and it's great for technique. <laughs> So we've got quite a few different challenges. Obviously 12-8 can be somewhat of an unusual um, passage for students, but the main opening theme, I will get students to play all up, up, right up the piano. They could start down here, etc. We can do, um, for rhythms, when you're working with triplets or groups of three, I tend to go, uh, so quick, 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 long, quick, quick, long. Or long, quick, long. So that's a great one. And as students actually really enjoy being able to play this passage really quickly up and down the piano. So that's, uh, that's part of the fun. If you can make uh, the technical aspect of it fun to achieve, then I think we're on to a winner. Um, in the B section, the left hand takes over. Uh, so you might want to do a bit of ghosting just to bring that left hand out because the balance has got to be shifted the other way to usual. Uh, we've got a chromatic scale. Uh, and then we've got this descending passage. And then we're back to the main theme. So pr practicing the crossing over of hands. Students love doing this. And I remember when my, my teacher used to get me to kind of paint up and down the piano when she was working on Something like a, a Chopin etude or, you know, this, uh, what is the, the Aeolian harp etude. And she'd be like, you've got to paint, paint on the keys. And she'd get me to do these motions just flowing over the top because that's effectively what your hands will feel like they're doing. Uh, so using that and in this kind of motion, moving down the piano uh, at, at bar 16, where they have this, this cascade can be a really great idea as well. Uh, and finally, we have the coda section, which has a series of arpeggios, crossing hands, almost crossing hands. And then some big grand chords at the end. And it's a really showy piece and you can teach students. The thing I love about this is, you know, most students will go, and they'll be there finished. So you can really teach them here to make something of it and throw their hands up a bit and make a bit of a performance of it. So it's a great piece. It's got so much in it uh, that students can have fun with and it really does work um, their aspect, aspects of m m lots of their technique. All right, um, so on to the final couple of questions uh, that all of our teachers have been answering. How do you teach different types of pedaling? Pedaling for me, I introduce really early on, as soon as possible. Uh, I, I've actually got a YouTube where I'm, I test um, uh, one of the pedal uh, raises for children. I think it's really important that if they're not using a, a raised pedal board of, or stand of some sort, that they can perch on the edge of the bench and at least kind of half stand to use some pedal because we know that piano without pedal is somewhat of a soulless instrument in some ways. So getting students into that as soon as possible, I think is great. I will have them play a series of chords to get used to syncopated pedaling. So playing the chord, keep it, holding it with the pedal, playing the next chord and then lifting up and down to clear the pedal. And they could do this with a scale as well. So that's how I teach the beginning levels of playing um, with pedal. 
As pedaling, as the music gets more and more complex, then for me, it's about taste and it's about helping the students judge how much to use. And uh, you know, quite often they won't use it or they'll use too much. So getting that fine um, balance is important. One skill that I do, uh, do teach my students and advanced students should certainly know about is half pedaling, where you only push the pedal down about halfway or where, you know, when it just starts to affect the dampers on the strings and getting them used to the fact that they don't have to put it right to the floor all the time uh, because the music may just not warrant it. Now, question six, what about transfer students who have poor technique but good reading skills or other skills? How do you go about retraining them? Now, I'm really strong on this. I was worried when I started doing my diploma performance work here in Australia with Caroline, who I mentioned in the bonus video, um, I was really worried that she would say, Tim, your technique is rubbish, we need to start again. Because I have heard this happening with other teachers and I don't want to do that with my students because it's so... Uh, hard, it's so debilitating for them to think, wow, I've come all this way, I've done all this work, and now I've got to start again by playing a C because I haven't learned how to do that properly. I don't agree with that because I think the chances of actually losing students are far too high. So my approach is to continue teaching the students and work in the technique aspects as we go. So if the student is really really flat fingered when they play, then it's not a matter of drop everything and let's fix this and let's do it with exercises for a month before you can do anything else. No, it's like, okay, well, let's find ways of strengthening those last finger joints, bringing the students awareness to what they need to do and helping them do that as they're actually playing. And that may be in videotaping and it may be in getting their parents to sit in for five minutes of their lesson and watch how their fingers are interacting. And it's gonna take some time. It's okay if a, if a finger or two buckles every now and then as you're improving things. So for me, <clears throat> Technique is important, but for a transfer student that comes, the last thing you want to do is sit there and go, sorry, we can't do anything until you have mastered your technique and you've got it perfect. Now, I'm going to be different to other student, other teachers. I know that for a fact, <laughs> but I guess having uh, been in that nervous situation of coming to a new student with a form technique, the thought that she would have said, no, Tim, it's not possible. Uh, you need to go and see another, another teacher or sorry, but I've got to work on technique for the next year before you can play your repertoire and do your exam. You know, it just wouldn't have worked for me. So that's my thinking on that. And finally, what's the biggest mistake uh, you see teachers making when it comes to teaching technique to intimate to advanced level students? I think um, teachers who don't pull aspects of the repertoire out and use that as technical exercise. I think that's a, a mistake. And it's also just um, uh, a, it's, it's just an easy way to make technical work more practical. So I really encourage teachers to do that. I would also, um, <clears throat> when it comes to the advanced level technique, think about ways you can mix things up. So check out the bonus video that I've recorded because I explore some great, one of my favorite sets of repertoire for um, advancing technique. Um, and also just throw in some new exercises because students by the time they get to this level tend to be pretty bored of scales and arpeggios and chromatic scales and things like that. So think about how else you can mix it up. I've got a whole blog post on how to turn off autopilot in scales by doing you know two notes in the right hand to one in the left. And if students haven't done this before, even at the advanced level, they're gonna find challenges in this. Or if they're doing Chopin um, nocturnes and they need to do a three versus two, can they? Can they do actually that as a technical exercise? So there's lots of ways of keeping it fresh and exciting in my opinion. And that's the biggest mistake I see teachers make. It's kind of doing just more of the same. Just before you go guys, I wanna make sure you're aware of Piano Pivot Live. It's my first ever Piano Teachers Conference and it's being held 23rd and 24th of January right here in my hometown of Melbourne. Beautiful weather in summer, of course. If you wanna find out more about it, head to timtopham.com conference. It's gonna be an incredible experience and I can't wait to welcome you to Melbourne. See you then.